Well, a wonderful time of praise and worship, isn't it? Hasn't it been great? If you um, have your Bibles, we're in Mark chapter 6 or in Matthew chapter 14. It is a, um, if I were to put a message, I should say a uh, theme to this particular message today, it would be Jesus moves from provider to protector. Provider to protect. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the feeding of the 5,000. He provided a miraculous setting where he fed 5,000 men plus women and children, estimating 20 to 30,000. Well, today we're going to move to the next particular story where Jesus is going to calm a storm. He's going to spend time in prayer. He's going to spend time in a quiet place. And it kind of shows his humanity. And then it's going to take us to the place where Peter walks on water and he gets distracted. He begins to fall and Jesus saves him. So we go to protector. I want you to think about that for a moment. Have you ever experienced his protecting hand? I remember a particular occasion for me. You know, when you're a teenager, you're always very smart, right? <laughs> always a brilliant brain. We're out in a gravel pit, uh, me and a couple other guys, and we are uh, in my... Uh, 58 Ford Fairlane 500 convertible. You say, wow. Well, it was a $75 car, okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the top is down, and um, I'm, letting, uh, I'm letting Ed drive. And we're... Uh, thinking, okay, I can get on the back of this thing and go ahead and uh, get on this. It had a, one of those little 352 police interceptor motors. Some of you probably are aware of those. It, you know, had some glass packs on it, so, you know, it was a little noisy. So myself and another guy got on the back and hanging on. And he's going through the sand back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and finally, all of a sudden, I'm hanging on, but the guy that was with me flies off the back end of the car. I thought, oh no. He's hurting. He's laying there. Stops the car. I get off the trunk. And uh, I go see how he's doing. And why I call him he, I forget who it was that fell. <laughs> this was not just a little time. Long, this is quite a long, long time ago, you know. Maybe five years. He's rattled a little bit and shaking, and, and he says, man, my ankle, my ankle. I said, well, let's get up and see if you can walk it off. He couldn't walk, couldn't walk. We had to take him in to the hospital. So we got in the car, and the way we went, long story short, he broke his ankle, put a cast on it. It healed up, and God provided for him. He didn't die. But I look at that and think, okay, I could have just as well fallen off on the other side or the same side and landed on him. Wouldn't that have been a terrible thing? So God provides. He protects. And he was a protector here when it came to the disciples because they were out there in a storm. Now get this. Just fed 5,000 plus people. And did you know it said that it was during the Passover? Now, do you know what the Passover is? The best way I can explain the Passover, Tony, is that it was like the 4th of July. It was a great celebration. Okay? Did you have a good 4th of July, by the way? Did you celebrate? 
Well, I didn't. Yeah, I did. I did. Saw, saw the uh, parade. You know, went to the fireworks. Matter of fact, I saw the fireworks like I've never seen them before. Lucy and I went somewhere. We, we parked. And uh, I won't tell you where because I'll probably go there next year. <laughs> but I could see the fireworks go over this building, and it was perfect. It'd go up there and just explode, and it looked like it'd just come in my way. And I said, isn't that phenomenal? Fourth of July, it's like Passover. They were during, it was during Passover, so it was a politically moving time. And if you look over... These stories are recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, where I'm going to give some attention to. You can find it in Matthew, chapter 6, verses 45 through 52, and then again in Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Some things leave some things out. Wait. Some of those authors leave some things out. Like some places don't talk about Peter walking on the water. Here in this particular particular chapter, in John chapter 6, it talks about Jesus leaving the crowd because what they wanted to do was instill him as king and president. They thought he was going to take over, I say president, king, authority. They were going to put him in charge because they had a defining moment in their minds of what kind of ruler he was going to be. And he wasn't going to be that kind of ruler. He wasn't one that was going to be powerful, boisterous, loud, personality plus. He was a soft, gentle shepherd that had a much different take on life than what they assumed. This big crowd was going to put him in charge, going to make him king. Look what he's doing. He's healing everybody. He's touching everybody. What a, what a, what a, what a God that he's the Messiah. I'm going to make him king. It said he withdrew. Did you catch that? In, let's look. I'm going to read that account. John chapter 6, verse 14. After the people saw the signs that he had done and what he performed, they gave, they began to say, surely this is the prophet. Now you have to go back to Deuteronomy. I think it's chapter 15 or verse, I think it's chapter 18 verses 15, something like that. I, I can give it to you. It's 18.15 in Deuteronomy. But it goes on here and says this. Jesus, knowing they intended to come and make him king by force, he withdrew again to a mountain by himself. He began to draw strength by a solitude place. Now, let me stop there and say this. Being that Jesus needed to get away, he was exhausted. You know, he was kind of human. He hit, Remember, he's God, but he's also human. He's God-man, right? We don't like to think of him sometimes as being like a man, but he... He was exhausted. He had spent time healing people. If you read the story, he's touching people. He's doing tremendous miracles. He's, he's, working, he's working hard in behalf of the people. And if you were to read a little bit more of the story back, you'll find that his cousin, whom he loved, you know who his cousin was, right? John the Baptist, John the Baptist had been beheaded. He was killed. And Jesus, after that, went away and prayed in a solitary place. So here again, we could say that he went away into a solitary place to pray so he could gain strength. Now, here's the key. If Jesus needed to go to a quiet place, number one, isn't it true that sometimes we may need to go to a quiet place? Reflect, regroup, get replenished, get strengthened. Sometimes our attitudes aren't quite right. Sometimes we get offended and we get hurt by what people say and what people do and what families do. Sometimes we have attitudes that aren't very good and we don't tolerate 
uh, people that think differently than we do, and we get a little upset, and, and different things that different things that can cause us to be weak-minded. You ever been there and done that? Yeah. Jesus did two things. I think they're important for us to, and he models it for us. Not only did he get away, but what did he do? He spent time in prayer. I can't tell you how valuable that is. I'm thankful that he modeled that for us. So don't get too busy. Take some time and replenish your faith and be strengthened within yourself and realize there's two things you can do. Escape, go to a quiet place, and pray. Well, I can't tell you there are times I need that in my life. God knows. And I've learned over the years how important it is for me to respond to a quiet place that's therapeutic and to pray. Now, let me tell you about how I pray sometimes. Maybe different than what you're thinking. I just don't pray by saying, oh, Heavenly Father, you know my situation, you know my circumstances, you know these people around me are bummers. They're just not with it. No, I don't, I don't pray like that. Let me tell you how I pray. I go to a scripture here. Let me take you to a place where I pray. <clears throat> it goes something like this. For this reason, since I heard, since the day we heard about you, this is Paul talking about the church at Colossia. He goes on and says, we've never stopped praying for you. You know how I pray? I go to the scripture and let it pray with me. Let it pray for me. Let it instruct me and help me. So what do I do? I should pray for you, the church. What does that do for me? Oh, nothing. Oh, it does. It might get my mind off myself onto what I should be praying for. You know what I'm saying? Don't we sometimes get feeling sorry for ourselves? And we're the only ones in the world. Oh, there's others that are struggling in the same frame reference as you that you need to pray for and care for and think about and lift them in prayer. So Paul says, this is what I do. I'm going to pray for you. He goes on and says this. He prays specifically for them. He says, we continually ask God to what? Fill you with the knowledge of of his will. How many need to know more about his will for your life? Yeah, yeah. So how should I pray? I should pray that God fills you with the knowledge so you can better know his will and purpose and plan. Because you know what? Sometimes when you're going through those hard places, that's exactly where God gets your attention. You with me? That's exactly where God speaks to us and helps us and can transform a little bit of our life. Then it goes on and says, to know his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Oh, whoa, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that the people that I associate with need the Holy Spirit? So I should pray this, God Fill these precious folks with your Holy Spirit. It goes on. There are nine things that Paul prays for. He says, the reason being, I should pray that they have the Holy Spirit. In verse 10, it says that they may live a life worthy. Live a life worthy. So my hope for you is your life will be not only found according to His will, not only found with an understanding so you have the Spirit, but you also have this kind of take. Your life is found worthy of the Lord and pleasing to Him in every way, as the Scripture says. So that's what Paul prays for. So I should pray for you that way, right? Now, let me tell you what it does for me. It gets my perspective right. Gets me thinking right. You ever heard of stinking thinking? I'm an authority. I'm an authority. But boy, if I pray the scripture, 
You see how important God's Word is to me? If you haven't noticed that yet, in terms of my preaching, I, I certainly hope you have. It fills my mind, it saturates my heart and mind on a daily basis. And I want you to know, it kind of oozes. This isn't even a part of my message here. I've gotten off base. But how true it is. This goes on and says this. I want, Paul says, I, I pray that the church at Colossia, I pray that the church at Alanson bears fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience. That means you're practicing some struggles, and you're practicing things that help you with your patience. Isn't that a bore? Are you with me? how we should pray for ourselves. You get it? Yeah. That's what Jesus took time doing. He was replenishing, replenishing his strength and praying. Now, got a couple minutes. Jesus moves from provider to protector. He's in the hills praying. Get the picture. He's in the hills praying, okay? He looks down, and uh, I, don't, I don't know what kind of storm it was, uh, the, you know, but here's kind of how I picture it. Uh, he may have had a picture of the moon. Maybe the storm was just subsiding, and the wind was still blowing, and, and they were out there three and a half, four miles on the Sea of Galilee, and uh, they were struggling getting to where they were supposed to be because they're going against the wind. You read the story, it, it's rather tenuous to think that they were struggling with this, this whole thing of trying to get there. Well, Jesus, out of his care and love for his, his friends, his followers, his disciples, he decides to go. And the only way he can go, there's no motorboat there. He walks on the water. He knows where the stones are. Did you get that? No. No. I don't believe there's any stones. He walks on the water to get there. And it's interesting. He described the, the scripture, I should say, Mark describes the, the disciples as being frantic, being afraid. It's a moment of chaos for them. It's a moment of chaos, and, and let me see if I can quickly find the word. Um, buffeted. If you'll notice it in verse 24, they were buffeted. Now, they, they weren't buffeting it. They were buffeted. Okay, the big difference. I know it's 12 o'clock. In other words, from the Greek word buffeted, it simply means they were in torment, they were being harassed, they were frustrated, they were cold, they were wet, and the wind is still blowing, it was boisterous, and Jesus walks on the water to get to them, to rescue them, to be their protector. Now get this, Mark says something rather interesting. Let me give you an example. Here's the boat right here. This is the disciples, they're working, their, they're working hard to, to, get, to, to get to the other side, and they're not making very much progress. They're three and a half, four miles out there. And they look up and see this, they see this person walking on the water. It says they're freaked. That's the word I use. They're freaked out. Now, here's what Jesus does. He's walking on the water. He gets by them. <laughs> My question is, why did he walk by them? Why did he walk by him? Here's an answer. It's very important. They needed to realize he was God. 
they needed to realize that he was Yahweh. That he was truly the Son of God. No question about it. He wanted them to know who he was. They discovered who he was. And Peter says, if it's you, have me come. And he did. To make a long story short, what did he do? He got caught up in the, just like you and I, got caught up in the froze of the wind and the waves. Remember what I said back in April about the winds and the waves? The storm? Got caught up in the storm. Got caught up in other things. That's what he did. He was walking fine on the water when he kept his eyes on Jesus. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, everybody knows this story. You know what happened? He began to sink. But notice who he thought Jesus was. Who did he holler out to? And what did he say? Lord, save me! Right? Lord, save me! The meaning, just that. He acknowledged him as God, Yahweh. That's what it means, Yahweh, the protector, the God of his salvation, the God of all, the creator. He is God, and Peter acknowledged it. Picked him up. What did they do? They got in the boat, and what happened? The storm was calmed. The storm calmed immediately. Immediately. So here's, here's the conclusion. How do I maintain my faith? In tough times. How do I maintain my faith in tough times? I can tell you this much. Certainly not with fear. You know what I mean? I'm not going to be able to build my faith with fear. It's going to have to be more than that. Jesus said this in verse 27. Take courage and don't be afraid. So in the flows of your life, in the trials and the troubles of your life, in the tribulations and the temptations and the trials, it's important that we understand, take courage and don't be afraid. I'm reminded, and he said, I am. Did you get that? In verse 27, he says, it is I, it is I. In other words, he's saying there, I am. I am, I am, I am Yahweh. He's identified and he discloses his divine authority as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And God is allowing him to help his disciples. And I want you to know something. God will allow him to help each one of you. Each one of you. He will help you. He'll be there with you and for you in a special way. Everybody agree with me, stand. Well, I'm glad we're all in agreement. Man, this is fantastic. Kind of got through this message as quickly as I could, but I wanted to come to a conclusion on it. Thanks for hanging in here a little longer. It's been a wonderful day of communion, hasn't it? Wonderful time of worship and praise. And Thanks for coming this morning. I want to thank our, our greeters for being there at the tables and greeting you and welcoming you and outside, thanking you for coming. Thanks for coming. We need to smile at each other, love each other, and encourage each other in the things of God. We need to receive it, don't we? Thanks, Jesus, for your love. Thanks for your presence in a special way. Thanks for how you help us, for being our God, for being Yahweh. For disclosing to these wonderful disciples who had a relevant purpose in their life, establishing the New Testament church that teaches us that we ourselves have you and authority in our life. So this morning, Jesus, we close by asking you to allow your power to overcome our inadequacies. You'll allow your might and strength 
It helps be more confident in putting more of our all into you and your love. Go with us today. Strengthen us and help us, Lord, to take our eyes off the circumstances and put them on you. In Jesus' name, all the people said, Amen. Hey, God bless you. Shake hands with one another. Thanks for coming this morning. God bless you.